and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then we cook the food from the case. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. This tragic and terrible case is one of the first true crime stories I ever followed. It happened in 1991. I was 21 years old at the time, about the same age as some of the victims, and for whatever reason, I became really struck by this event. I grew up in a small town with little crime and only two or three murders that have ever occurred there in its hundreds year old history. Maybe it's because I wasn't much older than some of these girls and I was a young adult just becoming interested in true crime, but this story has always felt especially tragic to me. I'm talking about the Austin Yogurt Shop murders, where four young lives were callously snuffed out by a murderer that remains unknown to this day. I lived in Austin from 2014 to 2017 and it is still probably my favorite city for a lot of reasons, but it was a much different place in 1991 than it is now. It has grown, it exploded is more uh, the better word for it. And um, because it was small and because it was different then, this case was not handled very well. 17 year old Eliza Thomas, 17 year old Jennifer Harbison and her 15 year old sister Sarah and Sarah's friend Amy Ayers who was just 13 years old were all in the shop. Jennifer and Eliza were employees of the store while Sarah and her friend Amy were in the shop to get a ride home with Jennifer after it closed at 10 p.m. Just before midnight on Friday, December 6, 1991, an Austin police officer who was patrolling the area noticed a fire coming from an I can't believe it's yogurt shop and called it into dispatch. Firemen arrived and put out the blaze. After it was extinguished, firefighters discovered four nude bodies. Each person had been shot in the head execution style with a 22 caliber bullet. Sarah's hands had been bound behind her with a pair of panties and she had also been gagged and it was found later raped. Jennifer was not bound but her hands were behind her back. Eliza had been gagged and her hands were also tied behind her back. All three had been severely charred and shot in the back of the head. The fourth victim, 13 year old Amy, was found in a different area of the shop. Her body was not charred, but did have second and third degree burns on it. She was found with a quote, sock like cloth around her neck. There are some other details to this story that I am choosing to leave out. So if you're more interested in this case, you'll have to look online for those things. There are just certain things on this channel that I choose not to discuss. Amy had been shot just like the others, execution style, but the bullet missed her brain. She had been shot a second time. And that bullet did do severe damage to her brain and had exited through her jawline. It was later determined that all four bodies had been piled on top of each other, but Amy had managed to crawl out from the pile and into a separate area of the store. When she did this, she toppled the pile of bodies. I mean, you wanna talk about a callous, senseless, disgusting crime. It doesn't get much worse than this. Autopsy results show the girls had very high levels of BTU output in their bodies, meaning the fire had burned very hot. This and the napkins found around the bodies led investigators to believe that an accelerant had been used to start the fire, and it was later determined that that accelerant had been lighter fluid. All four of the girls were seen alive around 10 p.m. and were planning a sleepover that night. Judging by the day's receipts, about $540 was missing from the cash register. I don't care if it was $5 million, but $540 for four lives. I, I just... From the beginning, there were issues with the investigation. Firefighters did their job by putting out the fire, but in doing so, they washed away a lot of potential evidence. Like I said, Austin was much, much smaller back then than it is now, and the city had no forensics unit and only a small fingerprint unit. There was only one homicide squad, and only one homicide detective attended the scene of the crime. John Jones and his partner, Mike Huckabee, were assigned to the case and were soon overwhelmed with over 300 suspects and dozens of false confessions. Due to the condition and the position of the bodies when they were found, investigators even looked into serial killer Kenneth Allen McDuff, 
McDuff had killed at least 14 people in the 60s and unbelievably was paroled in 1989 and then went on to commit many more murders after his release, including that of 22-year-old Melissa Ann Northrup, which eventually did send him back to death row. So they thought this guy may have had something to do with this because he was known to have been in that area at the time of this event. And on November 17, 1998, the day of his execution, McDuff confessed to the yogurt shop murders, most likely thinking that his confession would prolong his eventual death, but it did not. He was executed and his claims were thoroughly investigated and he was ruled out as the killer. There were two guns used in the murder, so the likelihood of it being someone like McDuff, a solo killer, is very small. The investigation then took the police to a teenager named Maurice Pierce. He had been seen with a gun at the mall on the night of the murders, and the mall is where Sarah and Amy had been hanging out before they went to the yogurt shop. When Pierce was questioned and his gun was tested, he was ruled out. So eight years pass with no arrests, and the case is passed on to new detectives. They developed new leads and brought four suspects in their 20s into custody. Forrest Welburn, Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen, and Maurice Pierce, yes, the same Maurice Pierce that had been questioned just after the murders, were questioned over and over. The theory was that the four had planned the robbery and something went wrong, leading them to murder all of the girls. Authorities tried twice to indict Wellborn for all the murders, but they could not link him directly to the crime and he had to be released for lack of evidence. Springsteen and Scott were tried separately for the murders and both were found guilty of capital murder. So Springsteen receives the death penalty and Scott is sentenced to 99 years in prison. However, shortly after their trials, very serious issues were raised that suggested both of the men were innocent. There was no physical evidence linking either of them to the crime and both men claimed their confessions had been coerced. Soon, evidence of those claims came to light when police misconduct was uncovered. Both convictions were overturned when the courts found that both Springsteen and Scott's Sixth Amendment rights had been violated. In 2008, DNA testing was done on the evidence collected from the crime scene and the male DNA found did not match any of the four men that had been accused and some of them jailed. To this day, most of the authorities still believe the four men were responsible and that a fifth man may have committed the rapes. Witnesses described two men sitting in a booth at closing time. They were having soft drinks and didn't look to be leaving anytime soon. Neither of these men have ever been identified. The Austin yogurt shop murders have never been solved and no one knows for sure who committed this horrific act. This is such a tragic case and such a truly despicable act. Four lives, four people, some of them children, gone over a few dollars. I don't know. It is my hope that one day they find the people that are responsible for this crime. Part of the reason that I started this channel is because I know that there is a backlog of DNA evidence and there are so many cold cases and so many unsolved cases that need to be closed for the sake of those involved and for justice. It is really my hope with this channel that we can help with those things. Stay with me right now. I'm going to show you a really quick and easy way to make frozen yogurt at home, food from the place of an absolutely terrible event right now as we go dining with death. Well, we are ready to cook, but we're not actually cooking today. We're just going to make a really quick and easy frozen yogurt. It's January 2021. We've all gained about 20 pounds in quarantine. And the only way this could be easier is if you just didn't make it at all. This is so simple and it's actually really tasty. And because of COVID, a lot of the frozen yogurt shops have closed down because of the self-serve nature of frozen yogurt. So this is something you can do at home with just a couple of ingredients and a food processor and it just couldn't be more simple. I'm sure the kids would love it too. This is probably as much sorbet as it is frozen yogurt. It's definitely going to be a very fruity 
frozen yogurt because I wanted to give you guys something a little bit healthier for a treat. I've got four cups of frozen mixed berries here. You can use peaches, you can use mangoes, you can use anything you want. I just chose mixed berries. I've got about a half of a cup of Greek yogurt here. Greek yogurt is one of the few things in the world that I can honestly say I do not care for. I hear it's really good, actual Greek yogurt overseas, but here in America, it just tastes like really sad ice cream to me. I've got some honey. I'm gonna give it a little pinch of kosher salt and a little bit of vanilla extract just because that makes sense to me in my mind. <laughs> You're just gonna grab your food processor. I had to borrow this one from my sister because in one of our moves, we have moved around a lot. We've been kind of exploring different cities for the last few years. I don't know what happened to mine, so thank you, Shauna. <laughs> Everyone needs a food processor. I didn't even realize mine was missing because I normally use like a stick mixer for things, so I'm gonna have to get myself a new one. Leave in the comments, which ones should I get? Which ones do you guys like? Okay, let's put our berries in. And I'm gonna blend these before I add anything else just because the container is quite full and if I put everything all at once, we might lose a lot of the ingredients onto the lid. So by blending it first, I can kind of incorporate my other ingredients better. Okay, we've got our frozen fruit all pulsed and kind of pureed a little bit. I'm gonna add about a quarter cup of honey. That was probably more like a third of a cup. I could just bathe in this. It's local honey too, so it's oh. Let's add in the plain Greek yogurt. Maybe a little bit more than half a cup. I'm gonna do just a little pinch of salt because salt always brings out the flavor of anything, even when it's sweet. And I'm gonna put in about a teaspoon of vanilla. I just think it sounds like it needs it. Okay, let's blend it up. This is just a little bit thick, so I'm gonna add just a splash of milk and kind of stir that, bring up what's on the bottom to the top. Let's blend that again. That's looking really quite pretty. It doesn't have the same texture because there's not as much dairy in it. But it smells really good and it looks like frozen yogurt. Last blend. I was gonna show you what it looked like blending without the lid on, but the thing won't blend without it, which is probably a really good idea. Why did I think it would? That is beautiful. Gorgeous color. It smells just like frozen yogurt. And how easy was that? Let's dish this up. So pretty. A texture and a color, right? I'm gonna add some coconut and some almonds to this. Okay, let's give this a taste. Mm. Mm hmm. That is really good. That's better than I thought it was going to be. It's so, so healthy. I was expecting it to taste healthy, you know? It doesn't. That is excellent. You know, I don't know that I've ever had frozen yogurt where I don't think about this case. Is that wild? It just, it, it just really stayed with me for a really, I mean, it's still with me. Every time I go to a frozen yogurt shop, I think of this case. It was just at the time, probably about the worst thing I'd heard about. I mean, of course, since then, I've become aware of a lot of things that are terrible, but it doesn't make this case any less terrible. I hope you guys make this at home. It's really good and it was so simple. If you've got a food processor, I mean, that's the battle right there. 
This would be a great way to use up extra fruit in the summer. You know, if you have a little garden, if you grow strawberries, you know how you get to that point in the springtime where you're kind of overloaded with fruit, throw them in the freezer and then do this with it. Cause this is good. A little bit of honey, a little bit of Greek yogurt, some frozen fruit. You could put peanut butter in this. You could put chocolate powder. I mean, Nutella. There's like a million things you could do with this. It was really easy and it's really good. Thank you for joining me today as we discuss the terrible case of the Austin Yogurt Shop murders. I hope you guys are doing well. I want you to know how much I appreciate your support. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Stay safe, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death.